all and welcome back. Today we are going to be looking at housing in Pompeii and the Gelanium. So this will more than likely be um, two videos because we don't want to bore you with going over a two hour video, it might be a bit too much for you. Okay, so let's start with our PowerPoint. So as we were saying before, we're looking at housing in Pompeii and Herculaneum. Okay, now keep in mind that a lot of people, they forget to do the housing in Herculaneum as well. And they focus on the housing in Pompeii because of course we've excavated far more of Pompeii. Um, it's very useful for your HSC to have both in hand. Now, I would say that you don't need as much detail for the houses in Herculaneum, except for a, a vital few, but you need to have at least a couple. Okay, so what we'll do here in this PowerPoint is we'll go over the basics of what does housing look like, what are the differences, but also go over about four to five actual detailed accounts of what these houses are, what are in them, and why you should know about them for the HSC. So let's go through, first of all, the types of housing. Okay, so when we're looking at Roman housing, we typically have four during this period. We have the dormus or the atrium house, the atrium or peristyle house, the insulite or apartment slash lodging house, and the villa. Now, when we're looking at these different types of housing, we're looking at the different way they're constructed, their purpose, but mainly what social class is using them, because this is often the distinction between why these houses are built. So for example, if we look on the left-hand side, we look at the Domus or the Atrium house. This is the most common house in Pompeii. And it's usually single story, and it's usually owned by the senatorial or equestrian class slash local aristocracy. Now that's quite um, interesting that the most common house in Pompeii is owned by quite a high um, social status. And it goes to tell you that most people living in Pompeii and Herculaneum were probably of a better social class and economically viable. Um, but to have a house during this time period, you actually had to be relatively wealthy. Most of these poorer people are going to be living in the apartment or lodging houses and communal spaces and things like that. And we'll go through that in a second. So a really good example that we have of the Dumas or the Atrium house is the house of Menander. Okay, and I'd advise you to have a look at that and see what that actually is. Now, the next one is the Atrium or Peristyle house. Okay, and this one's relatively simple. It's simply a house in the city with either an Atrium or a Peristyle in it. Okay, so the difference between this one and the Dumas or Atrium house is the inclusion of a peristyle, which is basically a colonnaded garden, and the creeping influence of Hellenic culture. Okay, so it recently became the centerpiece of wealthy households in Pompeii and Herculaneum. So most of these houses are not very old, unlike the Dormus or Atrium house. And they're centered around a peristyle, which visitors would usually enter through an atrium. Okay. This is going to be happening most of the time, but not all the time. A really good example of this is the house of Betty I. Okay? It's a quite a big house, uh, but it's a really good example of Pompeii of this particular style. Now, the next one is the insulite or apartment slash lodging house. And these are multi-story apartments. Very similar to what we're thinking of today when we're thinking of apartment buildings. They are small, closed in little flats. Okay. Um, where you might have one family staying there, you might even have multiples. They could even be above shops. So these are multi-storied apartments and more are found in Herculaneum than Pompeii. Okay, more people are living on top of each other in Herculaneum. They tended to be more cheaply built and possibly more affordable. So you're not gonna see a lot of the fantastic artwork and mosaics and things like that that you see in the age, uh, the peristyle dormices. These things are, well, quite frankly, they're industrial housing. They're meant for a lot of people to be used at the same time. And a good example of this is the house of the trellis at Herculane. Now, the last one that we looked at is the villa. Okay, and this is found on the outskirts of the city. So you're not gonna find 
uh, villas straight in the city centre. They are going to be relegated to sort of just approaching near the walls of the city, the outsides of it, or even just outside the city itself, inside the countryside. So what these are is they have, they're very large, they're luxurious, and they have multiple rooms, okay? And this is definitely something that was used by, um, as a holiday home by wealthy Romans. So you might have those visiting senatorial classes that might reside here when they're not in Rome, they're on their holidays, or you could have some owned by the local elite, but it's definitely a rich man's game. This. And a really good example of this is the Bill of the Mysteries. So we've gone through this a couple of times, but it's very important that you know what are the main features of the Dormus or Atrium house, okay? So for example, we have the entrance here, and this is quite simple. It's the through doorways often placed between shops, and shops would often be rented out to merchants. Now, the entrance that we have here is also called the focus, which means the throat in Latin. So literally, as you're going through this little space, which is the entrance of the building, you're going through the throat of the house. Now, we also have the atrium, and this is the religious and social center of the Roman house. Clients would have waited here to pay their respects, the salutatio, to the master of their house or patron. And it featured prominent portrait busts of prominent ancestors. You would also have the larium or the shrine of the household gods, which was located here. Mind you, it's usually placed slightly further above the atrium, usually in the wings of the house or the ally. So when we have this atrium here, it's effectively a square space where people are going to be gap free. Now, one of the things that's important to remember when we're doing housing in both Pompeii and Herculaneum is the difference between private and public space. Now, most of these housings, particularly the atrium housing, villa housing, these are public spaces. This is not something that you go through to retreat to a nice quiet place. These are centers of activity. And it's quite expected for people just to walk in and out of your house. There's very few places in that household where it's just simply a private area. Now, because the household is a public place, it also has to be put on display all the time, which means you want to be looking like your house is the best. We've also gone through a couple of different things. So although the interior of the housing is made to look its best because it's a public space, Usually when we're looking at housing in Rome, but also Pompeii and Herculaneum, the outside of it is rather dull, it's drab, and it's actually made to sort of shoo people away. They don't want you to think that there's a lot of stuff wealthy in there. Now, the next thing that we have is the complumium. Now, this is a rectangular hole in the roof, and it's provided lighting for the interior of the house, and you find the complumium usually right above the uh, atrium. And it's an inward sloping roof that was designed to catch the maximum amount of rainwater. Okay, so basically you've got the slopes going down like that. They are catching the rain and it's going to fall into what's beneath it, which is the impluvium. Now the impluvium is a large pool sunk into the atrium floor and the water was channeled into a system beneath the atrium floor. It also becomes a nice little centerpiece. And when we look at the house of the fawn, you can see that they start putting little decorations around it to sort of draw attention to it. The next one that we have is the triclinium room. Um, and this is basically the dining room. Many houses had two dining rooms, a water dining, a winter dining room that was inside and a summer dining room that was located in the garden or opened onto the garden. It is called the triclinium usually because there are three lounges that go around the room. And this is basically where you would sit and have your lunch, dinner, things like that. Um, and keeping in mind that the typical Roman fashion was to eat while you were reclining. So you're typically going to have two of these, one's inside when it's winter, the other one outside when it's summer. The next one that you have is the peristyle. And this is a really keen influence of the Hellenic culture in Roman society going into Pompeii and Herculaneum. Now, this is an open courtyard garden generally surrounded by colonnades, okay? And 
It's featured ornamental plants and statues, and often fountains, pools, murals, and running water. So this is very rarely placed at the beginning of the house, not at this centre anyway. There's a couple of few exceptions to this rule, but usually one has to get the parasol by going through the atrium. And this is something that's meant to catch the attention. It's meant to provide a view. You can look at it from the atrium. Romans are very big on their providing views, okay, the scenery. Um, and it's meant to be a sort of retreat. The next ones you have are decorative elements. So you have floor tiles on mosaics and murals or painted scenes on walls to display the allegiance of that particular household, what gods they favour, um, or even just to display their personal wealth. So here we have our little uh, display of what the ideal household is or the typical dormice or atrium house at Pompeii. So we can see here, we enter it in through here. This is called the focus, okay? F-A-U-C-E-S. And this is the throat of the house. As you can see, it's closed in just like a throat would be, okay? Now, typically on either side of the throat, you have these two things here. Now, you can see on this particular map that it actually opens up to the street. So this is the entrance to the house. But these two little close off rooms here, you can only enter through there, but they close off. They don't lead further into the house. That's because these would be the shops of the house. So the house might be growing something in the garden at the back that they would choose to sell in the shops, or they might have businesses elsewhere that would bring their goods here and they would actually sell from the house. Now, this is quite a public affair. And this is what I mean. Housing in Pompeii and Herculaneum was not just this private thing that we have nowadays. Very often, it's a mixture between the public and private. So if there is an opening to the street into these little rooms here, these are called taverna or taberne for plural. Okay. If, however, they are closed off from the street and then they might have openings from the inside of the house, these are called cells or cello. Okay. And they could just be used as storage for the house or as extra bedrooms. So what we're doing is we're going through the focus of the house and into what we would call the atrium. Okay, as you can see, the atrium is just this little square space. Now, as we we're saying, this is where clients would meet their patrons, okay, for the morning salute, basically. And you can see in the middle of it, we have this little square. Now, what this square is, is this is the impluvium. This is where the water is dripping into the house and would feed into their systems and provide their little water supply. Of course, right above that, you would have um, the compluvium, which is the sloped roofs that would be basically dripping the water into it, catching all of the rainwater and also providing natural lighting for the house. Now, typically you would have, when you're entering into that atrium, you have these bedrooms on the side, okay? So you can see, even though this is a public place, you do have these private rooms, okay? And these are usually only separated by what's a curtain, nothing else, sometimes not even that, okay? Now, these bedrooms are usually very dark, very spartan affairs. Um, if they do have a, a window, it's only like a little small slack Okay, um, you're going in here to sleep and nothing else. It's not like nowadays in our bedrooms where particularly in the children's bedroom, they bring everything in with them and um, that's sort of their space. That's where they keep their stuff now. In these particular time periods, this bedroom is only for sleep. And these bedrooms are usually called cubic cooler. Now, as we go further on into the house, we notice these two little wings here. Okay, these are little side spots in the house. Now, what we're going to look at here is what's called the ala or the ally. Okay, and this is where you would keep the family shrines of family virus, geniums, and things like that. Basically, this is where the family would go to pray. Okay, uh, it would be a very, very family like affair. There's not really much to do with the individual in Roman religion, it's usually based around a group. And the family prayers would be led by the pastor familias. 
going through the atrium still and kicking off from the allies is the tablinium. And this would be the office basically of the head of the household. And this is where their records and everything else would be kept through. Now, normally in most households, you have to go through the tablinium to get to what is called here the peristyle. Okay, so this is the backyard, courtyard, garden area. Okay, and you can see here it's squared off, means it's the court. And then you have all these little dots here which represent columns. Okay. Now, these columns are part of that creaking Hellenic influence or that Greek influence, as you want to use the modern day term. Keep in mind, we do not use Greek in um, ancient history examinations, typically not, because this whole idea of a Greek identity has not really happened yet. We use the term Hellenic. Now, going back off, you can see that we have more cubiculum around here. So there's multiple bedrooms in this ideal house. And if we're branching off here, we can see round about here, we have a triclinium, okay, which is the family eating room. So this is where they might have eaten in summer, okay. Now, this back area here would have been the hortus or the garden where the family would have um, grown their own food, okay. So you have a triclinium here where they can eat outside. This possibly might be another smaller triclinium that they could eat inside with. You can see here that we also have the kitchen, okay, or the kulina. And this is a very, very small affair. And most houses in Roman society do not actually have their own little kitchen. Uh, eating out is quite a big thing in Rome. And also it's associate cities of Pompeii and Herculane. Okay, so really important thing is to know your maps of Pompeii and Herculaneum. It's very important that you can do this, okay? Now, I have circled the things that we will be talking about today. So the blue one is the house of the Betty Eye that will go into specific detail. The yellow is the house of the Fawn. And then the green is the Villa de Mystery or the Villa of Mysteries, okay? Now you can see here, the house of the Vidii is relatively big, okay? Covers almost half a block. However, the house of the fawn is massive, okay? It actually covers that entire block 12. And that goes to tell you probably who might live there or their sort of social class. Please try and remember where all of this stuff is, okay? Because it's not every once in a while that they give a sort of little mapping question or a cityscape question. It's really important. You don't have to remember everything, every single street name, but it's very good to remember the main streets or the concourses that run through. You can also see here, this red line would represent sort of the city's boundaries or walls. The Villa of the Mystery is sitting outside those walls because of course, as we were saying before, it is a villa. It does not sit normally within the city walls. And if it does, it sits on those edges of it. Okay. So what do we need to know about the house of the Vedi? Well, it's possibly owned by the, what's called the Vedius brothers. Okay. And it is a Hellenized Domus type. And how do we know it's Hellenized? Well, we have multiple things such as the columns that exist within the peristyle and also the blaster. It has no tablinium and opens straight to the peristyle and the cellae are not opened up, meaning they're not tabernets, they're not shops, okay? And we don't have the tablinium, which is typical of what's called the Dormus Italica or the typical Italian house. This is something that's moved into a different style and it just basically opens straight up to the peristyle from the atrium. Uh, it's triclinium and peristyle are far bigger than others, which makes it a bit unique. And the outside is still very bare, sticking to the Dormus Italica. So even though you have this really super nice house um, on the interior of it, the outside of it still looks really bland. And that's really typical in Roman housing. So let's have a look at the actual house of the Betty Eye. Okay, so this is what it would look like in the normal 3D view. Okay. 
And what I would like to do is I'd like to drag your eyes to this right hand side here. So this is the layout of the house and we should all be very familiar with these layouts that we're doing, including these very popular or prominent houses that I'll be going through in this PowerPoint. Okay, so here we have the entrance. Okay, we have our small little focus there. And we arrive through and we're smack bang into the middle of the atrium. And we can see there in that middle is the impluvium with the confluvium right above it. Okay. Now we have here our little cells or cella. And you can see here, they have not been opened up to the public. Okay. So this means they are not tabernacle, they are cella. If we go to the right hand side here, we are also looking at a second atrium. Now, this is not something that you would typically see on most houses, but they can have two atriums. Sometimes they even have two peristyles if they're particularly big house and wealthy family. Okay. But they're basically entrance ways to the other places. So here you might have cubic cooler, okay, or just other storage places. And here you have the coolina. Now you'll see here, when we're going through this, there is no tablinium in the middle. It simply opens up into the massive peristyle. Okay. And then you have the big triclinium that sits on the outside of that peristyle. Okay. I would recommend that you really memorize this layout and really memorize the layout of what a typical Roman household looks like, okay? You should be able to, by the end of it, sort of close your eyes and think, okay, I'm walking through this part. What can I expect to see? What's going to be the next part? And follow your way through the end of the house. So this is a inside version or an actual photograph of what we look at. So what we can see here is we are sitting just on the outset of the focus, okay? And we are staring into the atrium and through the atrium into the peristyle. So you can see here, as I was saying before, the Romans were very big on their scenery and they love being able to look through the entire house. And this is why I was also saying it's not really a, a private affair. You can sort of just gaze right on through it. And because we've emerged straight into the atrium, we can see our nice impluvium sitting in front of us. We can see those little bits that section off the atrium. And then we can see straight through into that peristyle. And those, that peristyle is very identifiable because we've got the garden area, okay? It's opened up to the sky like most peristyles are. Okay, and of course we have our columns, which are signifying of our Hellenic influence. And this is a view from the peristyle as well. Okay, so you can see here it's a nice little garden area. Obviously, that's been manicured up. So it definitely wouldn't have looked like that as clean as that the moment we dug it out. But this is what we think it would have looked like. Okay, so it's sort of quiet, contemplative area. Nice way of showing off your wealth. Okay, fountains and things like that. But you can notice here there's quite a lot of decoration on the wall, mosaics, frescoes, paintings, that sort of thing. And this is a really important thing that we find in the housing of the wealthy. It is definitely a way of showing off wealth, but it also has religious rights, political um, influences, and things like that. Okay, the next one that we're looking at is the Villa of the Mysteries. Okay, now this is most famous for its holding of numerous frescoes possibly indicating a ritual initiation for the mystery cult of Bacchus or Dionysius, okay? Bacchus is the Roman name for that god. Dionysius is the Greek one for it. Because it's a mystery cult and it comes from Hellenic influences, you can get away from calling it the cult of Dionysius, but I would strongly recommend that you remember the name Bacchus first and foremost, okay? So this fresco that we'll have a look at in this house possibly is the lead up for an initiation of a person into this mystery cult, which we've talked about before, or it could be a lead up to a wedding and sort of the celebration of it or a how-to of the wedding. So what does it incorporate? Well, it incorporates a garden landscape and really shows off that Hellenic influence. Okay, And it's 
targeted for a restoration project, okay, or was targeted, it's not is targeted. It was targeted for a restoration project in 2013, which used lasers to clear black crust, which covered the frescoes, okay, and this is called vaporization. That's a really nice one to remember for conservation and preservation. And I would really recommend that you sort of have a look at this villa of mysteries and sort of go through it in a bit more depth. Because if you get asked about frescoes, you get asked about conservation, preservation, you get asked about all these little things, Villa of the Mysteries is one of those houses where you can smash them all together. So you can see here on our little detailed map of Pompeii that the Villa of the Mysteries stands outside of the city. Okay, because this is of course the villa. Okay, so looking at this, you can see that the Villa of the Mysteries is actually quite big. Okay, and it doesn't follow our normal format of what we would expect of the Dormus Italica or Roman housing. So let's actually have a look. Now, we don't have to remember every single thing that's going on in this villa, thankfully. Okay, if you can remember the general ideas of it, that's great, but we don't need to remember everything. So let's have a look, shall we? First of all, the old entrance, okay, we would come in through here. Okay, we're not exactly sure where the actual entrance of this housing is. We believe it came in from here, which is the old ones, but believe it could have changed around to start coming in from here. Either way, we notice something quite different. For example, when you were coming into the entrance, you arrive straight first and foremost into the peristyle, okay, rather than going through the atrium, which is the normal affair. So you'd go straight into the old entrance, go into the peristyle, and you can see that it is absolutely massive. Of course, all of these little dots here, they are, of course, our columns which surround the peristyle. Now, as we're going through, we would go through what is now the atrium, and we can see that because it has the inclusion inside of it. And we go through that, and this is what's called a hallway, okay, or the hall. Now, this hallway is a bit special because we can see here at the end of it, we have this little curvature. Now, most Roman housing is very blockish in nature, okay? Once again, to sort of detract people from looking too far into it. This house is meant to be set up to look beautiful from the outside and that irregular design is really drawing attention to it. But it also has something else that's really special. You would have windows here. And what it would allow is it allows someone to walk through here, stand here, and look at a nice panoramic view of the scenery around them. And this is pointed towards the sea. So you basically have this nice sea breeze coming through the house. But Romans just love to have a look at the natural landscape. So you'd be standing there going, oh, this is really nice, and so forth. Now, I want you to keep in mind that the house is also on a podium, okay, which is what this little section is here. There's actually even an underground component to this house, okay, which we won't go through. But the house is raised on the podium. And what we think this was for was to sort of raise it above the street level, because keep in mind, this was on a really busy road into Pompeii. So they wanted to minimise the sound. It would have also allowed them to have a better view from that panoramic scenery or panoramic windows and would have elevated the house. Okay. Now, when we're going through the hall, we turn a nice little shaft right here. Here is where we find the dining room or the cleaning, which is where those paintings were found, the ones that we'll go through in a second. Okay, really important that you remember those paintings. The other thing that I'd really like to point out with this house or villa, I should say, is what we have here, okay, which is the Torcularium. Now, this is a wine press shed, okay. So you, inside here, you'd find all the tools for making wine or squashing the grapes, okay. And this is one of those things where I like talking about where Roman houses were sites of commerce and economy, okay. So inside of this villa, it's not just a place where you can relax. You have your servants and your slaves running around 
doing these little jobs that would be earning money for the upkeep of the house. Okay. Keeping in mind that this is a villa, it sits outside of the city grounds. So it's probably going to have some nice little agricultural plots attached to it. So this here is the fresco that I keep on mentioning. Okay. And the following fresco's meaning from the Villa of the Mysteries has long been debated. However, many believe that it is an initiation rite into the cult of Bacchus or the preparation by this cult for a woman who is about to be married. And this opinion comes from a historian called Seaford. And this is probably the most um, prominent opinion that is out there. The fact that it is both of these combined. So it's a cult of Bacchus initiation and then they're preparing the woman in a cult of Bacchus style for marriage, okay? And you can see here that basically it follows the woman as she starts off from a very young child when she's probably proposed to be married and then sort of initiates her into the mysteries of the marriage, okay? Looking at fertility, sex and things like that. And then by the end of it, she's a bit more mature and ready to be married. Or at the very least, she has been initiated into the cult and accepted. Now, if you want to actually go through that, and I'll put this PowerPoint up in the Google Classroom. There's a really good website uh, link to this step-by-step -step describing what on earth is happening in this fresco, because it's a bit hard for us to identify everything. Um, with our different sensibilities these days, but I recommend that you go through it. Now, the next one that we're doing is the House of the Fawn. Okay, now this is named after the dancing fawn in front of the impluvium when you first walk in. And it is a massive house, okay? It takes up an entire block of the city as we saw before. It's also a Hellenized Domus type. Now, it contains two atriums and two peristyle courts, which really go to show you just how big this thing is. And it contains the mosaic of Alexander the Great, which is possibly the most famous mosaic in the ancient world. Okay, certainly the uh, most famous mosaic come out of Pompeii. And its entrance has pilasters with Corinthian columns announcing the owner's Hellenic influence. So, what that means, I'm not too sure if I had a photo of this. No, I don't. So pilasters are basically fake columns that you put out the front of your house and they look like they're supporting the doorway, okay? They're not, they're just literally aesthetic, okay? But they're basically saying to anyone that walks across in the street, this owner is cultured, they are Hellenized, they understand the Greek arts, they're basically big old fancy pants. So this is our House of the Fawn layer, okay? Now it's a bit hard because it's on the side. I wonder if I have a better one here. Forty me, I don't. So let's have a look at this, okay? We're looking at A here and we're going through the focus, okay, the throat of the house. And as we're going through here, we of course emerge into the atrium. Now, as I was saying before, this house is big. So it has two atriums. Now we'll notice something a bit different about the second atrium in the fact that it has these four little blocks around it. This does not mean that it is a peristyle. It is not the same one. And you can see that it's square blocks, okay? This is what's called a tetrastyle atrium, okay? So it's basically just another way of doing the atrium. There's nothing really to think too much into it. It's also a way of displaying the wealth of the owner. And you can see here that there is quite a lot of stuff happening in regards to this house. We can also see that the celli of the house are opened up, which means that they are tabernized. As we walk on through it, we have the cubiculars on the storage sides. Okay, we have the allies. And then, of course, we have the tablinums, both of them here, okay? Now, as we go through the tablinums, we are looking at the peristyle, okay, the first one. And then we have a second tablinium and then a massive peristyle, okay? 
Now, one of the things that I really like to point out here, and this is a nice one to remember, is H shear. Now, you can see there's something on the ground, a little square. This is actually a mosaic, and this is a mosaic of Alexander the Great, and possibly the most famous mosaic to come out of Pompeii. I'll go through that mosaic in a second. So this is the atrium as you walk into the building. And of course, this is the fawn. Now, this is not the original fawn. It's been replaced. The original fawn, I believe, is in the Museum of Naples. Okay. But you can see here, it is inside of the impluvium. Okay. And it serves as that decorative piece. And as you walk through, you can see going on through these massive peristyle. And you can see really how big that house is because you cannot see the second peristyle above that first one. Okay, so it's a massive house. Now, this is the mosaic that I was talking about. And this is the most famous one to come out of Pompeii. And it is a mosaic looking at Alexander the Great, who you can see here, fighting against the Persian king Darius. And the Romans absolutely loved Alexander the Great. They were always competing to outdo him, but they were always comparing themselves to him and things like that. And for this house to sort of have this, it's a really good display of wealth, but also look at me, look at me, I'm Hellenized, I'm cultured. Now, moving on to Herculaneum housing, okay? Now we have three houses that we're going to be doing, and I won't be doing the Samnite house today, not because it's very long, just because we haven't really covered it yet, okay? The two that we are really going to be looking at is the House of the Mosaic of Neptune and Amphitrite. I always say that name wrong, my apologies, and the Samnite house, okay? And we can see him there in this little block of Insula 5, okay? And they're pretty much right next to each other. Only a couple of things separate them. Now, there is another one that we will be doing, which is the Villa of Papyri. However, it is not on our map because it actually sits quite far out of Herculaneum, although it still resides within its boundaries. You can really see just from this map that Herculaneum is far smaller than Pompeii. And you can also understand why you might've had more apartment block buildings in Herculaneum because they had stack on top of each other, okay? Herculaneum is certainly um, more of a seaside resort town, not really a lot of industry going on here, and people who are living here are usually the richies. So let's have a look at our first one, which is the House of the Mosaic of Neptune and Amphitrite. Okay, and of course, remembering that this one is in Herculaneum, not Pompeii, please do not get that one wrong. So for starters, we're having a look at a double story house. Okay, and the owner probably lived in the top of that house. Now, important thing we have to through this before, double story housing does not appear in Pompeii and Herculaneum to the later part. So if you are seeing a double story house, we are looking at something that was probably built maybe 10 to 20 years before the volcano erupted and covered the city in ash. It is also known for its mosaic, which is believed to depict the god Neptune, which Greek name is Poseidon, and his wife, Amphitrite. It is connected to a wine shop, which may have been owned by the same person, more than likely was. This is the best preserved shop in the region and is an excellent input for public and private housing. And that's why I really like you to get from the house of Mosaic and Neptune and Amphitrite, okay? There's a lovely mosaic there, which is what the house is known for, but I really want you to get this idea into your head that shops were commonly placed within houses in Pompeii and Herculaneum. And this house is a really good example of how these two are just connected together, where the person's living on the top level of the house, but then the bottom level is the actual shop. And here we have our little layout now. Don't need to go too much into that. So this is what I mean by the shop, okay? So this is the bottom level of the house. Okay, and the wares of the shop are remarkably still preserved. Okay, and on the counter, we have with amphora lined on the shelf. And these are the amphora, okay, or the amphora. And these are the pots that the Romans are putting all of their materials and wares into. 
Now, we also have found broad, uh, broad beans, I believe that's meant to say, and chickpeas in the ware containers. What I want you to have from this is it's a shop. It's a really well-preserved shop. All of the wood has been carbonized, so a lot of it's original stuff, okay? And you can still find what they were selling in those emporas and pottery and things like that. Really get that into your head. Really well-preserved shop. Okay. Now, if you want, you can follow this link and read the page on that house, which I strongly recommend. Okay. And then we'll go through it in a bit more detail. The last one that I want to go through is the Villa of Paparo. Okay. And this is also found at Herculane. Now, why is this one famous? Well, for two reasons. First of all, it has, as you might imagine, a lot of papyri in it, okay? More than 1,800 carbonized papyri rolls have been in it, mainly writings from the Greek scholar Epicurus. Now, carbonized means basically it's been, not frozen would be a very poor word because obviously it was with the volcano, but it's been incredibly dried out when that initial ash wave came in and the heat wave, okay? And it's basically been sealed within itself. It's very hard to open this papyri roll without damaging all of the writing or just generally tearing papyri apart, okay? Um, the villa had the dimensions of an imperial residence. It has been estimated to be at 33,565 square metres. A colonnade of 36 columns circled the peristyle and a continuous portico allowed the owners and their guests to walk through around the extensive gardens. It is filled with statuary and fountains and supplied by a system of hydraulic pipes without ever once leaving the protection of the portico. A terrace overlooking the sea ran the entire length of the villa and a circular belvedere giving a 360 degree view was paved with one of the finest mosaics ever discovered. This house is definitively for rich people. Okay, it is massive. It has quite an extensive garden as we're looking at, is relatively hygienic, has flowing water. Okay, it's connected by pipelines. It is really a marvel of the ancient world. And then when we come into it, we see this massive library of all these Epicurean um, scrolls, which is all the writings of a Greek scholar called Epicurus. Now, because we found all of this uh, evidence of these Epicurean writings, we believe that this house belonged to Lucius Calpurnius Piso um, Caesonius, who was the father-in-law of Julius Caesar, because we know that he was a massive scholar of Epicurus, we know that we ha he had this massive collection. And this and the other pieces of evidence that we found led us to believe that he was the owner of this house. Now that's not a sealed deal, but most people will generally go along with that thinking. And it's pretty safe to write in your examinations. Just make sure you say it is strongly suggested by the evidence, not it's a certain. Uh, important thing to remember, this has not been fully excavated. So this is a nice little digital representation of what the house would have looked like in its heyday, okay? And you can really just see how large this peristyle is, okay? It's quite exquisite. It's built right onto the coast, okay? It's raised above it. And it would have had this absolutely beautiful view, as I was saying in the writing. And it was just a masterpiece of architecture. Now here we have the layout of it. And keep in mind that when we got into the actual villa for pirate, we had to tunnel into it. And a lot of it, as we were saying before, has not been fully excavated. So there's actually tunnels running all throughout the villa. Okay. And it's still an ongoing site of excavation. I would also say, and you'll notice that it sort of cuts off straight from here. This is obviously parts where we have not dug too far into it yet. So we don't know the full layout of the house. We're also not even sure, as you can see from here, where the entry might have been. So we think it might have been from there, but because we haven't fully dug it out yet, we're just not sure yet. Okay, but we can sort of go through the main parts. We can see 
We've got the beginnings of an atrium there, a peristyle court here, followed by a really big peristyle court. Okay, very much like the house of the fallen, where because they're so rich, they can afford two peristyle courts. Now, one of the things that I would like you to remember with the Villa Papyri is the fact that it's an ongoing dig site, apart from those papyri scrolls, which gave us a lot of vital evidence. And if you want to, you can look into that evidence a bit later on and look at how we're going to read that, mainly through x-rays and things like that. But a nice thing to remember is this argument that they're currently having at the moment over whether we should dig up the rest of the Villa Papyri. So this is primarily between two historians, and these are the names that you should remember, which is Andrew Wallace Hadrill and Robert Fowler. Okay. And uh, Wallace Hadrill basically argues on the side of, yeah, look, the Villa Papyri, it's really, really awesome. It would be great to dig it up. But do we really have that sort of moral authority to dig it up when we can't even look after what we have now? Okay. Meanwhile, Robert Fowler is basically saying, there's stuff in there that we need to know. It could actually collapse before we get in there. We've already started digging it up. Why don't we just finish off the job, see what we can find, rather than losing it forever? Okay. That is where we'd like to go from there. Okay. Sorry I didn't put this into two parts, but you've done really well with keeping up as it is. And I thank you for stopping by with us. If you have any other questions, please make sure you email us.